Good evening. I see by the clock on the wall, it's five after, so that means it's time to start. <laughs> it just depends on which one you look at. The one on the other side's correct, and it's five minutes slower than the one in here. We want to start by saying that we're glad to see everyone here. Uh, we're glad to see all of our members. Glad to see visitors with us always. Uh, this evening, uh, our song leader will be uh, Justin McCary, and our lesson will be brought by Forrest Bomar. And following the invitation song, we'll be dismissed to our classes. Uh, the two adult classes, uh, the one here in the auditorium led by Ken Hope, is Lord Help Me. And in room 19, Tyler Bush and Matt Clark will uh, be conducting the class Practical Christian Living. So uh, be sure uh, that you make it to the right class. We want to um, remember those that are uh, dealing with health issues. Um, the list that I have, um, Jim Tigner, Paul Lamb, Thomas Elkins, Sherry Howell, Larry Williamson, Jean Jones, Sherry Amex, Elizabeth Richardson, Ken Spears' brother-in-law, uh, Ed Wirt, and Lucy Newton's sister, Patricia. Also, we want to remember those uh, who have lost loved ones, uh, Ray Lynn and Tyler Bush, Buck and Joyce Underwood, Ralph and Linda Buchanan, uh, Nikki uh, Popola, uh, Charlotte Acton, uh, her aunt, Marcel Harrison. And we also want to remember her and Tom as they are traveling to Mississippi. Uh, let us begin with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for all the things that you do for us. We're grateful that we're able to come before you to call you our Father and to be able to make our requests known to you. We know every good thing in our life comes from your hand. We pray for these of our number that we have mentioned, those that are dealing with health issues and those that have lost loved ones. We pray that you would be with them, that you would comfort them, that you would be with those that are attending to them. We ask that you would be able to help them to recover, help them to be able to deal with their losses, and for us to be able to be there for them, to do those things that might benefit them to uh, proceed through this time that's difficult. We pray for all of those that are of this number, those that are dealing with the issues that we might not know of. We ask that you would be with them, that you would give them those things that they need. And we know many times we have prayed to you and we have had those prayers answered in a positive way. We thank you for those times that you have answered positively for us. We ask that you would be with us during this service, that you would help us to remove those things of the world from our minds and concentrate on the lessons before us. Forgive us when we fail thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 746, when he comes in glory, number 746. Oh, how sweet will be to meet the Lord when he comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise. That is not the right tune. Let's go back to this first slide. Hmm. Right. Let's use our books real quick, number 746.
Oh, how sweet will be to me. will be number 771, number 771. Detour, detour, detour. Life is filled and saturated with detours. Construction crews seem to be everywhere. Driving on the roads with having a detour is unusual in our day and time in Garland. Detours cause delays in travel due to the long lines of people that are waiting. Detours in life can be frustrating, they can be unexpected, and they can be confusing. Whether we encounter literal detours or metaphorical ones, they often catch us off guard. How we deal with detours determines the success in getting to where we are going. What is a detour? Detour in life are alternate routes that are taken due to some circumstance. In Exodus 13, verses 17 and 18, God used a detour for his children. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Just as we encounter physical detours in life, we also encounter detours in our spiritual travels. 
Detours are designed for our own good, regardless of how we view them or how we feel about them. God uses the detours of our lives to teach us about himself. As God's purpose for causing the Israelites to deter was to keep them from returning back to Egypt. So are our spiritual detours. They are to protect us. They are to help us. Paul describes the Christian, ra our Christian life as a race. In 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, Galatians 5 and 7, Hebrews 12, 1, and James 1 and verse 7. In our race, there are also detours that cause us to take alternate routes due to certain circumstances that we encounter. Perhaps these detours cause us to change directions or lanes that are associated with our mission. We may not be able to proceed on the same, in the same lane or at the same speed in accomplishing our goal. Some of these detour, detours are manifested in the changing of our approaches to our timing in dealing with the situation. God may allow us to experience these detours in our spiritual life because, number one, because of divine construction. Just like road detours are necessary for construction and improvement, God takes us on detours to construct something in our lives. These detours may seem inconvenient, but they serve a purpose. God is interested in our development as well as our arrival at a destination. Detours are also necessary because of character building. Detours allow us to grow, to learn, and to develop. I'm talking about spiritual. They build our character, our perseverance, and our hope. Romans 5, 3 through 5 reminds us that the tribulations lead to perseverance, proven character, and hope. God uses detours to shape us into what he wants us to be. And also detours are to help prepare us for our destiny. God has a destiny for each of us, but rarely does he take us there in a straight line. Detours prepare us for greatness. They equip us for the journey ahead, even if they seem confusing or sometimes lengthy. Question this evening is, brethren, how are we doing with our detours in life? Paul asked the Galatian brethren in Galatians 5 and verse 7 a question. He said, you did or you were running well, the Christian race. Something happened. There was a detour. What caused that detour? What was that detour? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Of course, we know as we studied that book that it was the combination doctrine that the Judaizers were teaching that was necessary for one's salvation. And of course, we know that Paul spent a lot of time and a lot of effort showing the falsehood of that doctrine. The question this evening is, when we encounter one of these detours in life, do we find ourselves frustrating and wanting to quit, to give up, because things don't go as we think they ought to go? You remember Paul's words to the saints in Galatia in Galatians chapter 6, 9 and verse 10. He said, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. 
So when we encounter these detours in life, don't give up. Because if we continue, we will reap the benefits. Do we find ourselves complaining or grumbling because we have a detour that we need to take? If so, remember Philippians chapter 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Why? That you may be blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Do we find ourselves losing our faith or losing our trust because of these detours? We know that if Paul said in Romans 8, 28, that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So this evening, how are you doing with your detours? Maybe you haven't done so well with some of your detours. Maybe you found your faith becoming weak. Maybe you found yourself becoming frustrated having doubts. If you need prayers this evening to help you to strengthen your faith, to keep you going on, even though the detours happen, we're here to help you. We're here to pray for you. We're here to help you in any way that we can. Or perhaps you haven't obeyed the truth, so you can't avail yourself of the help and the assistance that God gives us being a child of God. If you want to know more about how to become a faithful child of God, then let it be known this evening and we'll be glad to help you. Whatever your need is, come as we stand and see. Interesting, a little bit different, but it catches our attention, invitation. Great, great spiritual thoughts were brought out and thoughts that we need to be contemplating and thinking about. It's great to see everyone this evening, those who are with us. Uh, we're looking at the series on Wednesday nights, Lord, Help Me. And tonight, our study is going to be very interesting. Uh, it's going to be very needed. I believe it's going to be very helpful. And it's going to be somewhat controversial. And I say controversial not because I want it to be, uh, because the Bible is very, very plain on what we're looking at, the subject, the topic. But again, to some, this might be controversial, even though it really shouldn't be. Now, if I get blamed for this lesson, I'm blaming it on 
our brother John Segala. Okay, he's the one that submitted it, and I'm foolish enough to undertake it. And so in this series, Lord help me, here is what Brother John suggested. Lord help me to know how to feel about my government officials and what to say about them. <laughs> now, everybody has their opinion. Uh, I'm trying to stay away from opinion. Uh, it's somewhat impossible to do, but nevertheless, I'm going to try to stay away. What I, what I want us to do is to really focus upon what the Bible has to say concerning, we might call it politics, I think better known as government. There is a difference between the two, and we'll note that in just a moment. But so, Lord, help me to know how to feel about my government officials and what to say about them. Remember what I've already suggested. The Bible has quite a bit to say about this. And so, again, there shouldn't be the confusion that there is in the Lord's church. Now, in the world, there's going to be a lot of confusion because people do not respect, they do not read they do not understand, they do not know the scriptures. Thus, they do not know what God has to say about this subject nor any other subject. But in the Lord's church, we should know better. We should understand how to view these two questions. Remember, that's really what we have here. How to feel about my government officials and what to say about them. Now, we're beginning tonight to look at three things to consider. And we're really sort of laying a foundation, the groundwork for next Wednesday night. But I think these things are important. These things we need to understand, and they'll help us to know how we should feel about our government officials. And they'll help us to understand what we should say about them. And so here's the first thing I want us to pursue for a moment. Our attitude about and towards authority will have a lot to do with our response uh, to our government. Think about what I'm saying here. Our attitude and, you know, the, the way we approach authority, the way we look upon authority... It's going to have a lot to do about our response to government and really anything else in life, but specifically we're looking at government, our government officials, how we should feel about them, what we should say about them. Well, what is your attitude toward authority? What's my attitude towards authority? Let's get honest as individuals. Notice this. We want to do what we want to do. Now, there's no doubt about that. Every one of us, to a certain extent, to a certain degree, we want to do what we want to do. Also, we don't want anyone to tell us what to do. And likewise, we don't like anyone over us. And I think the Bible sort of spells that out concerning humanity. Uh, notice in Judges 21 and verse 25, we usually go to this verse and just cite the last part of it. But notice the first part. The first part is as important as the second part. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Now notice the response. Notice the outcome. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. No king, no authority, no quote-unquote government. And so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Think about these verses with me. In Zephaniah 3 and verse 2, Concerning God's people, Israel, she heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. She did not trust in her Lord. She did not draw near to her God. 
And again, that's just a very defiant, rebellious spirit. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to have anybody tell me what to do, not even God. He did no voice, accepted no instruction. In Jeremiah 5 and verse 31, you remember there Jeremiah says, The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their own authority, and my people love it so. You know, that's what people like, is when the prophets tell us what we want to hear, when the priests do the same, when our government gives us what we want, when they allow us to do whatever we want, yeah, we love it so. But you know what, at the end of that verse right there, Jeremiah 5 and verse 31, a question is asked. What will you do in the end thereof? The whole sequence is, it seems so good when we get to do whatever we want to do, when the prophets just lie to us, when the priests never stand up with authority and oppose us, when all of them just tell us what we want to hear. Remember in Jeremiah 6 and verse 14, they were saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And so they were just going along with the people, letting the people do whatever they want to. And they loved it that way. Uh, it seems so liberating. It seems so free to have no one over us, no one telling us anything. But God asked a sobering question. What will you do in the end thereof? You remember Proverbs 14 and verse 12? There's a way which seems right unto man but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Oh, it seems so good at the time, but it's not good. That way that we're following that seems right, that we really love, is the way of death. And so when you think about that question in Jeremiah 5, 31, what will you do in the end thereof? The very next verse answers that question. The book that follows Jeremiah is Lamentation. What they will do in the end of their foolishness is they'll have an opportunity for 70 years to lament, to moan over their rebellion, to grieve that they did not listen to God Almighty and that the prophets and the priests lied to them. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 10, it talks about those who despise authority. Remember, we're asking the question, what's my attitude towards authority? That's going to bear heavily on how I feel about my government officials and what I say about them. If I despise authority, then any time they stand for the good of the people, for the good of America, and in essence enact laws that prohibit what I want to do or what somebody else wants to do, well, we're not going to be happy with those government officials, are we? And so, again, Jude verse 8, they reject authority. Well, if I'm one who despises authority, if I'm one who rejects authority, then I know how I'm going to feel about government officials. I know what I'm going to say about them because they're standing in the way of letting me do exactly what I want to do. You remember in Luke 19 and verse 14, the citizens of that country, they said, we will not have this man rule or reign over us. I was talking about Jesus. He's teaching a parable there. But once again, we don't want anybody over us. And again, that's the problem today with a lot of people concerning Jesus Christ. He has commandments. He has laws. But those who despise and reject authority, we're not going to have this man reign over us. He's not going to tell me what to do. You remember Luke 9 and verse 23? If any man wishes to come after me, this is what Jesus says. If any man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. I'm still convinced that that verse right there the principle, the premise behind it is one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons many people are not Christians today because they understand 
If I become a Christian, I have to deny myself. I have to take up a cross, my Lord's cross, daily and follow him. And once again, we're not going to have this man rule over us. He's not about to tell me what I'm going to do. In John 10 and verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's respect for divine authority. That's respect for the authority of Christ. And so, again, as we think about how should I feel about government officials, what should I say about them, first of all, check your attitude towards authority. How do you deal with authority? What do you think about authority? Again, if I was not a Christian, I'd probably have a very different view, approach to authority. Now, I'm saying that simply about myself. I do believe that's probably true about you and anybody else. But I'm saying, I'll guarantee you, if I wasn't a Christian, then yeah, I know that I'd have a different view of authority. But as a child of God, understanding what the Bible teaches time and time again, we have, you know, opportunities to view authority and to see that authority is not my enemy. Authority is good for me. Think about this. As children, what does the Bible tell us? Honor your father and your mother. At a young age, we should understand that there is authority. And here's God's attitude. Here's what he wants me to do with his delegated authority, father and mother. He wants me to honor them. Ephesians 6 and verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And so Christians have an opportunity, hopefully at a young age, to come into contact with authority and to understand that authority, again, is not my enemy. Authority, God delegated authority, is my friend. It's keeping me from doing everything that I want to do, most of which would not be good for me. And not only that, but again, wives, the attitude towards authority. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, look at verses 22 through 24. We're talking about, of course, government. We're talking about our officials. How should I feel? What should I say about them? But really, the background for all of that is my view towards authority. As a Christian, I should have been exposed to authority quite a long time ago. And my attitude towards authority in these realms will also bear heavily on my attitude in the realm of government. Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 20 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. I was talking about an attitude towards authority, submission, obedience. You know, in a lot of our wedding ceremonies, marriage ceremonies, you know, the, the old vow to honor and obey, you don't hear that anymore when directed to the wives. Why? Because in our society today, the ladies do not want anyone over them. They don't even want at the beginning of marriage, many of them, to understand that I am to respect, I am to submit, I am to obey my husband. Look at Colossians 3 and verse 18. Colossians 3 and verse 18, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. 
Now, we don't stop there with authority. Husbands, turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to read verse 3, and, and here's what we might refer to as the divine pecking order, okay? Everyone lives under authority, whether we recognize it or not. And so in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Notice that. Man has a head. Man has authority over him. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Notice that last statement. Even Jesus has authority over him. This idea when we think we're just going to shake off all authority, I don't want anyone telling me what to do. It's so foolish, it's so immature, it is childish because everyone lives under authority. In Ephesians 5 and verse 23, turn back to that verse. I want to make a point here because I fully understand if you're just looking at the world, now hear what I'm saying. If you're just looking at the world and husband's attitudes in the world, then I fully understand how the feminist movement gained momentum. I fully understand why women said, uh-uh, I'm not going to be in subjection to that man because the concept of headship is totally wrong in the world. The concept in the world is, I'm the boss, I'm the head, Whatever I say goes, you don't have any say, you don't have any rights. That's not the biblical concept that we're looking at. Yes, man is head of the woman. But go with me again to Ephesians 5 and verse 23 and notice this. Notice this, for the husband is head of the wife. Now, the verse doesn't stop there. It goes on to qualify that headship that the husband has. The husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Remember, we're talking about being head of the home, yes, but I'm head of the home as Jesus is head over the church. Here's some verses that maybe some men don't like to view. But in Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. So the head of the church has all authority. Yet guess what that meant to Jesus? Being head of the church didn't mean that he didn't love her, that he didn't care for her. It really meant just the opposite. I'm going to take care of her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. That's what headship means. Loving headship, Christ-like headship. You remember this one who has all authority? In Matthew 20 and verse 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Again, Luke 22 and verse 27, Jesus simply says, I'm among you as he who serves. Notice what he did with authority. He didn't say, I am among you as the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you do exactly what you're told when you're told. Don't you ask any questions. Now, that's not his view of headship. I have all authority, yet I'm among you as the one who serves. Husbands, I would challenge our thinking to realize that's what, that's what head of the home means. That's what head of the wife means. It doesn't mean you're a tyrant. It doesn't mean she has no voice. It doesn't mean she cannot express her opinion. It doesn't mean you're right all the time. It means as head of the home, you get to be a servant. You get to serve your wife. You get to serve your children. Now again, remember this in government. 
Because that's what government officials should be. I'm not saying they are, but that's what they should be. They are public servants, okay? The abuse of authority is clearly seen in the home. It's clearly seen in our government. That now I have a little authority. It goes to my head. I'm intoxicated with that authority. And so now I'm in control. I have all authority in heaven and on earth. Go back and look at Christ. And let's strive to be more Christ-like. Now, not only that, but as Christians to elders... Remember, how do I view authority? Well, go to Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Look what it says. Now, remember what I'm saying. If I wasn't a Christian, if I didn't understand these things, then yeah, my, my view of authority may be a lot different. But understanding authority and God's delegated authority in these areas, my view, my response to authority should be one of submission, should be one of obedience. Look at Hebrews 13 and verse 17. It says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Stop there. Those who rule over you, what am I supposed to do? Remember, I don't want anybody ruling over me. <laughs> but you obey those who rule over you. And what? And be submissive. Look what it goes on to say. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Turn also to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5. Now, we're not going to look at the first part of chapter 5, but this is instruction to the elders. And the elders have a responsibility. They have authority, but they also have responsibility with that authority. One of the things they're told is not to lord it over the flock. Oh, you have authority, all right. But remember, you're not to lord it over the flock. And then when it gets to the Christians... Notice what it says about their responsibility, again, to the leaders, to the elders. Verse 5, Likewise, you younger men, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now, Keep this in mind, usually we use that verse in chapter 5 and verse 5, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We usually take it and just apply it to my attitude towards God. That's not how it's applied here. It's applied regarding my attitude towards my elders. Am I proud? Am I arrogant? Can they not tell me what I ought to do biblically? If that's the case, remember, God resists that person, the proud, the arrogant, but he gives grace to the humble, the one who does exactly what he says. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. That's what shows if we are humble, our submissive nature to our elders. And also now specifically regarding what we're looking at, Christians to government. And let me say this, to our government. This is any government, anytime, anywhere. Don't, don't try to pull this, well, you know, I would listen to what God says and I, and I would do what God told me to do if... If our government was quote unquote Christian, and if our government was doing what they ought to do, you know, going back to childhood, we know the principle do two wrongs make a right. Let's not throw out a childish argument to excuse our rebellion. Uh, we're not going to get into this until next week, but Jesus taught. And specifically, it was of the Jews to render under, unto Caesar what was Caesar's. It was a question about taxes. 
Is it lawful to pay taxes? Jesus said, yes. You render to Caesar, Caesar, Rome. Rome was the very nation coupled with the Jewish nation that crucified Jesus. His attitude was you respect them. You pay taxes to them. Paul will notice as we read in just a moment in Romans 13, he's going to tell us about our attitude toward government. He lived under the government of Rome. Rome, again, was the very government that later on in Paul's life would put him to death. He would be beheaded by Rome. But he's going to teach you be submissive to them. This is God's delegated authority. And Peter, Peter has something to say about it too. Tradition says, once again, that Nero had Peter killed. I know it's tradition that's telling us this. Tradition says that when it came time, Peter requested to be crucified upside down because he wasn't good enough to be crucified like his Lord was. Now, what I'm saying is, what we're about to read was written when people were being told, you be submissive and you obey Rome. And so let's not pull out a childish argument that I can't be submissive to this government. Yes, you can. God says you can. God says you better be. And you'll answer for it one day. Now turn with me, if you will, Second Peter. I mean, First Peter, the second chapter. Look what Peter says. Now remember, he's talking about Rome. Second Peter, 13, uh, Second Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, in verse 13, I'm starting in. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the kings as supreme, or to governors, or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That's pretty straightforward. Peter did not give any loophole to the Christians who lived in the first century, who lived under wicked, oppressive Rome. Rome was putting Christians to death in the face of death sentences. Peter says, you be submissive. You honor the king. If you can't be submissive to our government, I'd like to see what we would have done back then. Now, turn with me, if you will, to Romans 13. Romans 13, and as I'm saying this, we all know, we all know that there is a governor, if you will, placed over our obedience. If the government, if our nation is telling us to do something in opposition to God's will, then yes, by all means, Peter says we must obey God rather than men. But excluding that exception, we are to be obedient citizens. We are to be submissive. Why? It's God's will. You know, Daniel was in Babylon, and Daniel was obedient as a citizen. You can go down the list. Joseph was in Egypt, and Joseph was obedient. And so there's no excuse at all. I don't care what the government is. God says regarding that government, whatever it is, be submissive. Now, look at Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. 
It, it can't be stated any plainer than that. And so as we think about how should I feel about my government officials, what should I say about them, I know, you know, we all know they're not perfect. That's a given. But it doesn't stop what the Bible tells me to do. Two wrongs don't make a right. You're telling me to be submissive to that man? You're telling me to obey that man? Yes, as long as that individual, as long as that nation does not tell you to do something in opposition to God's will, you be submissive, you obey. You be the best citizen that you can be. Now, notice this second observation. Let's not be guilty of misusing the principle of separation of church and state. Today, there is a gross misunderstanding of what that truly means. You know, in our Bill of Rights, when this was suggested, this exclusion clause or whatever you want to call it, for 150 years, our nation had no problem understanding what this meant. It's only because we've drifted so far away from God and His teaching now that everyone questions this. Everyone has their opinion on what this means. Let's not be foolish. Let's, let's not misunderstand and misuse the principle of separation of church and state. Now listen to these points. The proper use, the correct understanding, has nothing to do with how it's used today. Unfortunately, in today's climate and culture, separation of church and state has become to mean separation of state and God. That's how the liberals have used it. That's what they want us to believe it means. Separation of church and state, well, that means separating the state, the government, from God. Never has meant that. Never will mean that. Again, uh, too far... Too far, too many. Julie, what did you mean by that? I didn't have a chance to, to go over Julie's points. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, let's say far too many. Oh, too far, too many. Separation of church and state has come to mean that religion, morality, and God has no place whatsoever in government. You see, that's how it's being used today. Separation of church and state. That means nothing can be said biblically. Don't bring up God at all. Let's get rid of morality. Let's get rid of everything. That's not separation of church and state. That's not what was intended at all. Thus, many falsely conclude that separation of church and state means that government should have absolutely nothing to do with, quote, religion, except to suppress and oppress it. And that's what's happening today in many quarters, even of this nation. Separation of church and state simply assumed and demanded a division of labor. The church has its work and the state has its job. Remember where these founding fathers came from. They saw in Britain the problem of not much separation between church and state. State ordained religion. That's all they were trying to oppose. They were just saying the church has its function, the church has its job, the state has its job. But once again, they were not trying to restrict religious freedom whatsoever. It was for the purpose of religious freedom that they wanted a separation of church and state. Then you don't have to be a, quote, member of the state-sanctioned church. You are free, conscience sake, hopefully biblically guided to be a member of the religion of God's dear son. Let's just put it like that. Now, notice this. Thus, we might conclude, for instance, that the church is not to maintain a standing army or to wage war against the state. That's part of what separation of church and state means. The church has its own function, its own work, and it's not to maintain a standing army. It's not to wage war against the state. Likewise, the state has no right to impose a state religion. That's what we're talking about when we use the phrase separation of church and state. 
it's important to keep in mind that God ordained both civil government and the church. You know, when you stop and think about it, there are three divine institutions. Of course, the first was the home, Genesis 2. The second was civil government, Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. And the last, the church. Jesus came to build his church, Matthew 16 and verse 18. And so both the church and the government are answerable to God. Both the church and the government are answerable to God. They both have their function. They both have their work. The church is not to do the work of the state, the government. The government is not to try to do the work of the church. Both are answerable to God. Uh, let's look at some Bible verses here. Let me flip over to where I have just a few verses mentioned here. Uh, concerning the church answerable to God, turn with me to Revelation, the second chapter and the third chapter. We're not going to read all this, but in Revelation 2 and 3, you can see without hesitation that it's so obvious that the church is answerable to God. The church is answerable to Christ. He is the one who built her. And for example, this is the only example I'll give. Look at Revelation 2 and verse 5. This is to the church at Ephesus. He has bragged on her. He's boasted about her. But then in verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You've left your first love. And so look what he says in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else. Look at this. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What's Jesus saying? You keep this up and I'll guarantee you, you will not be my church. I will remove your lampstand. And he says similar language to five of the unfaithful congregations here. But also, government is answerable to God. Notice, if you will, turn with me to Daniel, the second chapter. Now, I know we're going to be caught with that second bell, but we'll, we'll pick it up here with what we do not get to read. In Daniel, the second chapter... A few verses here, so important. Look at Daniel 2 and verse 21. It says, And he, this is God, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Sounds like to me that God is in control, even of the state, even of the government even of an empire. Notice again, he removes kings and raises up kings. Look also, in Daniel 2, look at verses 36 through 38. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Notice, God gave you this, Nebuchadnezzar. You didn't take it by force. You didn't take it by wisdom. God raised you up. God placed you here. Now, notice again. Still in Daniel, look at Daniel 4 and verse 17. Daniel 4 and verse 17, this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdoms of men, gives it to whomsoever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. Notice also verses 25 and 26 of this same chapter. They shall drive you from men, this is what's being said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. 
They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And in so much as they gave the command to leave the stump in the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. We're going to stop there. But keep in mind what we're looking at. How should I feel about my governing officials? What should I say about them? Well, first, what's my attitude towards authority? If I'm rebellious, if I'm proud, if I'm arrogant, I'm going to have the wrong attitude towards our government. And again, keep in mind what separation of church and state does mean, and keep in mind what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean what so many are trying to push today, that it means that God has no place in our government, that he has no place in schools, that he has no place in public life. That's what some are trying to indicate. Foolish and fatal. We'll pick it up here, Lord willing, next Wednesday night. Thank you for your attention.